John 17. Now we know this is a great prayer of intercession by the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're going to major on the divisions and maybe get through about three verses. Uh, it's a great prayer of intercession in that Jesus Christ prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and he prays for you and I. He prays for those that would believe on him through the disciples' word. And we need to pray for those that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as we continue to preach the gospel as well. Now, we're going to major again on the divisions this morning. First of all, we're going to look here in John chapter number 17, verse number 1. Verse 1 is the statement of the occasion. If I had an outline, this would be the first point, the statement of the occasion. The Bible said these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. The hour is come. Now the phrase the hour has appeared sporadically in the Gospel of John. We'll find it in John chapter number 2 and verse number 4 when he told his mother his hour has not yet come. And then in, again in John chapter number 12, and verse number 23, when he said, the hour is come, the hour is come. In John chapter number 17, verse number one, the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Father may be glorified in him and he in the Father. Now, how is he gonna do that? By coming to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you think about what Luke chapter number 19, verse 10 says, that Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. If Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost, then how many people are lost? Everyone. That really puts a hole in Calvinism, doesn't it? Puts a hole in the Calvinistic theory. Everyone that was lost, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the whole world is who he's talking about, not the whole elect world. Well, the whole world, by the way, scripturally in Hebrews chapter 10 is elected to believe the truth. We're elect. When Jesus died, he redeemed or he purchased the world. So in that sense, we are elected to believe the truth. I did a sermon on election and predestination one time specifically, and if you'd like a copy of that message, I'll be glad to get it for you. But in the Bible, Israel at one time, the Bible uses them as the elect. Angels were used as the elect. And so is the church at one time uses the elect. And then the whole world elected to believe on the truth. So Jesus died for the whole world. The greatest glory of God is the impartation of eternal life to men by bringing them to God. How? By faith, in faith. And the Bible says over here in 1 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 18, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So Christ brings us to God. Only through Christ can you find salvation. Only in Christ and through Christ could you ever go to heaven. According to John 14 and verse number six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, but through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, revealing, by God bringing us to God in faith, revealing himself, how did he do that? In his incarnation, that's God became a man, and that was the climax of Christ's spiritual work. Uh, he came to reveal the Father. Now, while you're in John, just turn back a couple of chapters to John chapter number 14. John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is claiming deity. If you believe God, believe also in me. And then to skip on down to verse number nine, Jesus saith unto uh, Philip, he said, have I been so long time with you and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father and how sayest thou then showest show the Father? If you wanna know who God is and what God is like in his character, just watch the Lord Jesus Christ. As we read about him, we're looking at the very character of God. We see his character in the person of Christ. And also in his incarnation, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came born of a virgin in a manger, lived a sinless life. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number one and verse number two, 
that Jesus hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. God speaks to us by his son in the last days whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds. Jesus Christ is creator. How do I know that? Well, the Bible says so, especially if you really want to get some real plain language, go to Colossians chapter number one. You'll find he's a creator. He's a creator. He's a builder. He's a designer. He's the owner. He is everything. He's all in all. He is the fullness, Colossians 2, of the Godhead bodily is what the Bible says. All right, so our first point, our first point was uh, that the statement of the occasion, the statement of the occasion of this particular prayer is mentioned there in verse number one. And then in verse number two, we see the definition of his work, the definition of his work, of Christ's work. The Bible said in verse two, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now, verse number two says, to all whom thou hast given him, that he should give eternal life. Now, it's noteworthy to, to, to listen to this and to pay attention. If the language in verse number two sounds as though salvation was restricted to a predetermined few whom God hath given to Christ, it should be noted, first of all, before you go down that path, it should be noted, first of all, that this prayer was addressed to one member of the Godhead by another, and you're listening right here in John chapter 17 to a family discussion, a family conversation of deity, amen? Christ owns creation. He owns creation. We've already established that in Colossians chapter number one. The world is subject unto Christ. He died and he paid the penalty for every man's sin. That is the world's sin. There can be no question in the Bible of it's a whosoever will gospel. It's whosoever will hear him. John 3, 16 should be sufficient for anyone to believe that. And by the way, if you'll just look back in John chapter three, hold your place there in 17, go back to John chapter three. John chapter three. The Bible lets us know here in verse uh, 15 and 16, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world. I don't know how in the world people get off in reading that verse saying, well, it's just the elect world. Well, I'm telling you the world's elected to hear the gospel. The world is elected to hear the gospel. And you believe 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I was sharing with someone earlier this week, you, 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 that's how God saves an individual, by them hearing the gospel and that individual making a choice of whether he wants to be in the family or not and be with Jesus Christ. Pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth on him. What's the condition for salvation? Believing. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is what? You don't do anything to be condemned. You're condemned already. You were born that way. You were born lost. Who did he die for? The lost. Who came to seek and to save that which was lost. Lost. And if you're here lost today, you can count on it that he came for you. He came for you. Amen. He came to save you. All right. So the Bible's very clear on that, but there's more. There is more. And we wouldn't do the message justice unless we turn to these scriptures. First John chapter two, please. First John chapter two. The Bible's very clear in first John chapter number two. And he says in verse number one, that to my little children, these things I write unto you, that, that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That advocate is a go-between, that lawyer that, that uh, stands between God and myself, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And the Bible goes on to say that he, who's he? Jesus is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. Not for ours only. Ours, now you can go back to John chapter number one, verse nine, if we confess, if we, verse 10, who's he speaking to? 
John, uh, Brother Archer said John had the last word. I'm glad he had these last words for me to read in the book of First John, Second John, Third John, also Revelation. Uh, the way is open. The way is open. If we believe, if we believe Christ, so he's a propitiation. That means he's a satisfactory sacrifice for our sins, Christians, and not for ours only, but also who? The sins of the whole world. If the Holy Spirit did not put verses like this in the Bible, then you might could entertain this false doctrine of predestination and election uh, in the Bible. But these verses are in there, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Are you listening? I hope you are. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of who? All men. Again, the Holy Spirit of God puts things in the Bible that, 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 can, that, that can bring to your mind there is no question that Jesus Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the whole world. He said he's a Savior of all men and then he says especially of those that believe. Believers in, in, under the sound of my voice today and watching in, you know Christ is your Savior. But what I did not know until I came to that realization that He's my Savior, I didn't know that He was my Savior before I ever believed Him. What does a Savior do? Saves. Brother Dana brought that out. He, the Savior saves. He redeemed. He died. He shed His blood. And by the way, He's only going to do that one time. And he's already done it. He's not coming back. Jesus will never come back and go on the cross again. And he never will shed his blood. He never will be humiliated like he was, according to Philippians chapter 2, ever, ever, ever again. He's done it one time. And it's sufficient for everyone for all. Is what the Bible makes clear in Hebrews chapter 10. So you're going to believe that or you're going to miss it. You're going to believe Christ or you're going to miss it. Simple as that. Simple as that. And then uh, while we're in John, let's go back. We're going to look at John 17. But while we're, let's just go on back here to John chapter 7 just for a moment. John 7, just so, so you find out that we're not just picking and choosing some verses. It's all, this thread runs throughout the Bible that Jesus died for everyone. All the way from Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 8, uh, verse uh, 16, 15, Genesis 3, 15. Actually, you go before that. You go before that, you see a blood sacrifice when God had to kill an animal to put clothe Adam and Eve. But we find that resurrection gospel, the death and the resurrection gospel mentioned in John 3, I mean in Genesis 3.15. All right, now I'm in John chapter number 7 and verse 37 and 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, if any man thirst, if you're thirsty, come unto me. If you're thirsty, if you're thirsty, he can satisfy that thirst. If you drink of this living water, John chapter 4, you will never thirst again. If you eat of this living bread, you will never hunger again, John chapter 6. John chapter 7, in the last day, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. As the scripture has said, a lot of times men are making their own list of righteous deeds, self-righteousness, which they think in their minds will pro promote them to uh, 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 some, some standard or some capacity that they could gain audience with a holy God and present all of their works to Christ saying, I think that you'd overlook this or this and this. But Matthew chapter 7 says what? Although they said, I preached in Christ's name, cast out devils in his name, and in Jesus' name done many wonderful works, what was the answer of Christ in Matthew chapter 7? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So anyone going about to establish their own standards, you better throw that out the window this morning. You better throw it out. So it won't hold water, my dear friend. It will not hold water in the presence of Almighty God. You trying to establish your own righteousness when the Bible makes it clear that Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to who? Everyone that believeth. 
everyone that believeth. And then we have in John chapter number eight, <clears throat> verse number 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Never see death. What is his saying? That you believe on him who God has sent. John chapter six, we know that's clear. We know that's clear. Believe on him as the scripture has said. Not as a man-made path to get there, but as the scripture has said. And then if you'll notice in John chapter number 11. Wow, we're getting to the resurrection chapter here now, Lazarus. John chapter 11 in verse 26. And whosoever, what a, just give me a definition of whosoever. Whosoever. <laughs> Anyone, whosoever. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then the question, believest thou this? Jesus is, is, is putting his credibility right here on the line. In John chapter 11, he put his credibility on the line with Martha and Mary and then all of the crowd of the unbelieving Jews. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus did exactly what Christ said. He came forth bound. His credibility on the line, Jesus came through. Believest thou this? I am the resurrection and the life. Though you're dead, even today spiritually, you can be made alive. You can be resurrected from that old dead state you're in, quickened. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number two, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the statement of the occasion his hour was come, the continuing in the definition of his work, <clears throat> I mentioned about, we gave several verses on Jesus died for every man. E every man, not just a select few. People are confusing foreknowledge with predestination. They are. That's what, what they're doing. Foreknowledge, to say that God doesn't know who's gonna be saved and who's gonna be saved, is calling him less than God. He knows everything. He knows even he knows your thoughts. He knows what you're sitting there thinking of the preaching right now. <laughs> he knows what you're doing. He knows how you're you're weighing it all out. Amen. He knows these things. He's God. But that's foreknowledge. Predestination always in the Bible is that it's predetermined that you should be as a child of God, you should be conformed to his image. I've got no problem with that, do you? I have no problem whatsoever with that. The moment that I believe Christ, the righteousness of God entered into me, eternal life entered in. And I'm sealed until the day of what? Bodily redemption till this body is gonna match the inside. So it's predestined that I be conformed to his image. That's, that's pretty simple. How in the world can anyone ever confuse it? I, I'll never know, I'll never know. I, I, I think about it a lot. So um, Christ's work, uh, and by the way, people are using as a, it, this is scripture, just like Acts 2.38 scripture. Th this is the Bible, but people are, are twisting this particular verse over in Acts chapter 13. Um, these are hard verses that no one likes to tackle. But uh, a fellow up in Crossville one time said, Preacher, I, I'm following you, but I have a question on, uh, on one verse. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's Acts chapter 13, verse 48. And so we read it. And the Bible never contradicts itself. Never, ever, never, never. And the Bible says in verse number 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. They were glad that Jesus Christ included Gentiles in the family of Abraham, salvation. They were so glad. They, so there was joy there. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So they'll pull that particular scripture out and you said, aha, uh -huh, you see, you have to be ordained to eternal life so you can believe and be in the family. My dear friend, a divine ordination to eternal life is the effect, not the result. It's the effect. Let me explain myself. 
That word ordained, if you look it up, means to be arranged in an orderly manner. Those who set their minds to seek him, what happened to them? They found him. Arranged in order, as many were ordained, as many as seeks him, as many set things in order, as many that order their conversation aright, God will show the salvation of the Lord. So that verse right there does not support, it doesn't support Calvinism whatsoever. Amen. So they, they're they pitiful and, they're, and they're, 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 I feel sorry for them. And there's no way that anyone that's under that doctrine can know they're going to heaven. There's no way. There's no way that anyone that believes that can, could know they're going to heaven. If they really believe the teaching of John in, uh, of that of that false religion, then they'll never know. Well, I just got to wait and see if I'm one of the elect. John, who had the last word, says that we can know that we have eternal life, and He's in us. Amen. So Christ's work was the impartation of life. All of his teaching, his signs, his person, his death, his resurrection were all a part of Christ's calling. That's what he came to do. So we can honestly say that this prayer is a fulfillment of Christ's commission. Think about that. Here's, it is. All right. So we have uh, the occasion for it. We have the work. And then the last point I want to bring is... A living contact. Jesus, this prayer is a living, Jesus is a living contact rather than just imparted information. A living contact rather than just imparted information. Now, in verse number three, the Bible said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Verse three really explains verse two, but we look right here, a living contact rather than just a, an imparted, or imparted information. Uh, verse three, this is life eternal. Eternal life is very, very important. It is even, even eter the word eternal life because uh, Jesus actually made a difference uh, what was that dif dif differentiated that's the word I want to use differentiated Jesus differentiated uh, uh, eternal life from the current concept of endless existence you see life ultimately eternal existence is life ultimately without the Lord Jesus Christ it's called the second death which is an endless existence of damnation Hold your place in John 17. Go over to um, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20. When I was seeking the Lord, for my, I was, there was an empty place inside and I wanted to know Him. I wanted to know that I was going to heaven. Uh, this verse right here, it just really, it, it, it floored me. And it still does every time I read it. It still just... Gets, it excites you. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. The Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in Christ Jesus shall never die, according to John 11, verse 26. Friend, you don't enter into eternal life. Eternal life entered you the moment you believe. Eternal life entered you the moment you, you, you believe. Amen. In Romans chapter number 10, Paul prayed for his brethren and he said that they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Did you know the Bible says here in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20 that Jesus came to give you an understanding? You don't have to muster up this, this, this faith. You, you don't have to, 
you, you don't have to say, oh dear God, give me an extra shot there. No. What you do is you get in the Word. How much of the truth do you want? How much understanding do you want? Then put some things in order, like Acts 13 says, as many as were ordained, he gave eternal. Put some things in order and begin to seek him. And according to the word of God, if you seek him, you will find him. You will find him several places in the word of God. We have an understanding opened by the power through the power of the word of God and the Holy Ghost of God to salvation. We know that to be true. Luke 24 said he opened their understanding. John chapter three, the spirit of God is like the wind. He, he, we, we, the word of God is that powerful. And I went to a church, I told you one time, I went to a church and uh, visiting a church and there were some people sitting on the first row or two here and uh, they, would give, they went around giving testimonies and they said, they're waiting on the Holy Spirit to come by. I wonder sometimes if some of our folks aren't waiting on the Holy Spirit to come by. Let me tell you about the Holy Ghost. He's God. He's God. And did you know what the Holy Ghost said he would do? He, listen, all, all you have to do in that, and in, in, in he does it all, I understand this, but he works never contrary to the word of God. All he needs to do is for somebody to hear the word of God and he goes to work. You follow me on that? He begins to convict. All you got to do is preach the word and he does the convicting. I got an easy job. All I got to do is just open this Bible and begin to read it and he does all the work. The word of God itself is powerful. The spirit of God convicts and illuminates that truth. Now, we don't stop there though, child of God. What do we keep doing? A saved person has a growing knowledge. Who said, did you say that this morning? We're forever learning. We're forever learning. We are. And I thought about eternity in Revelation 21 and 22. It would be a dull place if I got to the point I knew everything. So what's, what's eternity? Eternal life going to be? It's going to be forever learning. <laughs> and you will never come to the status that Almighty God in Christ is. But you'll be forever, forever, forever learning. Eternal life. Let me tell you what else. Eternal life is the end of the philosopher's quest for ultimate reality. Not only that, eternal life is the end, the end of the scientist's search for truth. One of my favorite preachers in the world has gone home to be with the Lord. His name was Jimmy Johnson out of North Carolina. He graduated the same classes uh, with... Um, uh, some people that we know and love. And Billy Graham was one of them. And, and, uh, but he got up and gave his testimony. One of the greatest preachers I've ever heard. He got up and gave his testimony. And he was an astronomer. And he kept searching the heavens. He was a physicist and an astronomer. And he, was searching, he was searching the heavens and just marveling at the work of God. Recording everything that he saw. And he came... He came to a point in his life. He came to the end of his quest when he said somebody had to do that. Somebody had to do that. This just didn't happen. It, it didn't happen. Nothing cannot create nothing. Something had to create it. And his quest brought him to Jesus Christ. And he said, there's the answer. That There is the answer. Um, not only... Christ is so satisfied that God gave him that power, in other words, to bring you to him. But it's a man's satisfaction as well. Not only is God satisfied, but it's a man's satisfaction as well because it's a personal acquaintance. It's a personal acquaintance with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy, and I'm closing with this, in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 12, here is, here is really the final expression of a real born-again experience. I've met a whole lot of people that knew what to say but never had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says, I know what I believed or I know in whom I believed. What I believe. That doesn't sound right, does it? 
You see, it's more than just an imparted, imparted knowledge. It's the power of God. It's Christ Jesus. Again, I've met a lot of people who know what to say, but never have had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm asking you to think about that today. And if you're here lost without Christ, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by trusting Him, by believing Him. Let's stand to our feet.